Whoa. Whoa. This, is, this mic is hot, but um, let's pull up my notes real quick. It was funny. One time in, I spoke in high school, and, like, I made a joke, like, I'm, like, dependent on notes or, um, like, dependent on, like, filler words. And some girl literally counted how many times I said, um, and, like, counted how many times I said, like. It was, yeah, hurt my feelings, but... <laughs> Anyways, let's, let's jump right into the text. Uh, I'm speaking from Matthew 6, 1 through 4, continuing this um, sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so in verse 1, it says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together as a community and, and study your word and, and hopefully um, learn a learn a little bit more about ourselves and, and about you. Um, I pray that we would just be good hearers of the word and, and better doers. We ask this in your name. Amen. So <laughs> over the summer, um, Megan reached out to me and a couple others asking if we would um, participate in this like Monday sermon series. Um, and, I, and I did this once before last year and like it was a, it was a humbling experience and I really, I really did enjoy it. Uh, but I thought it was funny because my immediate reaction when, like, she asked me was, like, yes. Like, I'm excited. I was already planning my outfit. Like, I was already planning, like, I'm going to get a fresh fade. Like, everything. Like, I want to make sure I'm all, like, shaved. Um, everything. And then I read this passage. And I was, like, this is, like, this, this can't be right. Like, it just it didn't make sense that, like, I got paired with this passage of all the, of all the passages. Uh, but, yeah, as this, like, Enneagram 3 um, I'm a Christian, so obviously I know the Enneagram. But this Enneagram 3, it's like this, it's this achiever. Um, and and I, I struggle with that. Like everything in my life, I want to achieve. I want to like be the best. And I want everybody to know about it. I want everyone to know about it. Um, and I think a lot of times we, we look at something good and we take that good thing, that good work, that good act, and we, we do anything to make it about ourselves, right? I think it's inherently a good thing that God is enabling me to be up here speaking this word, right? It's, it's inherently a good thing, yet my human nature, my fallen condition wants to make it about myself. And, and that's just the reality. And I think it's something that all of us really struggle with. Um, I think of an example, like think of, you know, the people in the Starbucks line, right? You're up there, you're, <laughs> you're paying, and you're like, the, the Holy Spirit just comes over you. Right, and you know the idea of having your caffeine just gives you a little bit more joy, and so you're like I'm gonna pay for the person behind me, right? That's inherently a good thing. But how often do we like go to like doctor up our drink? But in reality, we're just like sitting like a like a mom on Christmas, like waiting for them to notice and like look at us, right? We're just <laughs> we're looking at them like side eyeing them, waiting for them to notice, and and we think like oh they're gonna remember that person in the tan jacket, the like white Air Maxes, they're gonna remember them forever, right? No, they're. <laughs> Reality is they probably will not. But even like little kids, like as, we're, as we like grow up, we're like wired this way. Like we crave this attention. We crave the recognition and, and this approval of others. For me, <laughs> uh, it was like when I was little, I would always play basketball in front, of, in front of my like house. And I would be like trying to get recruited by the UPS man. <laughs> I cannot be the only person that did that as a little kid. We'd be like hooping in front of our, you know, in front of our, house just praying someone would like drive by and notice how good we are and like try to sign a contract um <laughs> but I'd, I'd be trying to do these like new dunks and they're probably like all terrible but I'd be trying to do these new dunks on like the six foot hoop and I just remember as soon as I would get like one slight variation of a dunk I would like clockwork I'd, like sprint inside grab my mom grab my dad grab my siblings be like you have to come watch this dunk and like in reality, it was probably like a lob off the backboard and I got like a two inch vertical. Like I probably went, no, it's probably like the least impressive thing that they've ever seen. But all I wanted was for them to say, great job. Like I wanted them to applaud me. I wanted them to say how well I did. You see, we're wired to crave this recognition. 
And I think that's what makes following Jesus. It makes it so countercultural, right? Because he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. In reality, that's all we really want. It, I think of like a hamster wheel. We're like stuck in that, in this hamster wheel, this constant cycle of, you know, doing a righteous thing, doing a good work, and we receive this temporary validation, but we're, we're kind of left feeling unsatisfied, right? Because it was kind of, it was more for me, not for, you know, not for Christ, not for that person. And so I guess my question to you today is what is your motivation? Right? What is your motivation? Is it maybe to be seen? Is it to be applauded? And I think it's important that we ask ourselves, like, would you still be following Jesus if no one was watching? If it was just you and no one else was around, would you still be following Jesus? And it comes down to this truth that our motivation should be to become people so transformed by the grace and love of God that good works just flow out of us without second thought. See, in Matthew 6, Jesus, he sets up this picture and, and he's warning us not to practice righteousness for, for reward from others. But he's not saying, do not do good works. That's not at all what he's saying. In fact, he's actually assuming that they are going to do good works. It's not, it's not a if you do good works. It's not if you give to the needy. He specifically says when you give to the needy. But for Jesus, it's not just the right behavior. That's not, not quite enough. You need the right heart posture and the right motivation, which brings us to this verse two, where, where Jesus, he really sets up these opposing motivations. He sets up a, a, a negative motivation. He sets up this positive motivation. So first, this, this negative, he says, those who announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do to be honored by others. You see, if, if you're doing it for the approval, it's more likely than not, you're gonna get what you want, right? I'm gonna walk off this stage, you know, feeling good about myself, and I'm sure, like, I'm gonna get a compliment or two. Someone's gonna say, oh, your shoes look good. Like, right, I'm gonna receive that validation. I'm gonna receive that, and, and I'm gonna, you know, obviously it's, it's, gonna make me, <laughs> it's gonna make me feel good, but you're gonna get that congrats. You're gonna get that applause. But here's the deal. Jesus, he's not down on your doing good works for a reward. But he's saying if the reward that you seek after is simply the applause, the validation, the recognition from others, you're setting your sights far too low. And you're ultimately, ultimately you're selling yourself short if that's all you're in it for. Because there's so much more that the Father has in store for each of you. For me, there's so much more. And that, and that brings us to this verse three and four, this positive motivation. Um, Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And again, Jesus, he's talking less about behavior, more about motivation of the heart. And as we follow Jesus, this end goal is to grow and mature into the people that God has called us to be who do these Jesus things without thinking about it, much less thinking of it. And Dallas Willard, he is an absolute genius, but he puts it, he puts it this way. He says, the kind of people who have been so transformed by their daily walk with God that good deeds naturally flow from their character are precisely the kind of people whose left hand would not notice what their right hand is doing. As, for example, when driving one's own car or speaking one's native language, what they do naturally, often automatically, simply because of what they are pervasively and internally. These are people that do not have to invest a lot of reflection in doing good for others. Their deeds are in secret, no matter who is watching. For they are absorbed in love of God and those around them. They hardly notice their own deed and rarely remember it. You see, your father who sees what you do in secret, he will reward you. There is a reward. And, that, and, and Jesus even says that's the right motivation to pursue that reward from your father in heaven, even if nobody else on earth sees and so I guess to, to get to some application points. So how do we break free from this, this constant cycle of, of needing approval of others? 
what's that? What's that next step? How do we break free? And I've, I have three points. Um, I know it's Monday Chapel, so I'll try to go. I'll try to be fast. But the the first one it's is to be transformed by grace. Be transformed by grace. You see this, you know this this need to to feel the approval of others, the applause of others. It's ultimately a fallen condition. It's a fallen condition. It's it's the natural thing to do to crave attention, even for like the most insignificant things, right? My my wife Jill, she uh, she's in the nursing program, and she the other I think it was like a week or two ago, she went to a like some elementary school, and they were teaching like first graders how to wash their hands. Um, and I mean, I went to a private school, so we didn't really have cool things like this. But some of you might have done this <laughs> growing up. They use it's called like glow germ. And so they, like, rub this glow germ all over their hands um, and let it dry. And then the kids have to go wash their hands, right? They have to go wash their hands and see, like, how good of a job they did. So they come back and they, like, shine a black light and, and show, like, the, you know, the spots where their hands are not washed. And so it was just so funny because all it took was, was one kid saying, I don't need the black light because I did a perfect job washing my hands. And like all of a sudden, just like a chorus of first graders being like, oh, I did too. Like, oh, I, my, like my hands are clean. Like, and it's funny because then they start saying like, well, my hands are clean, but I did it faster. And they're just like back and forth, back and forth. When in reality, like all of their hands are covered in this like glow germ. Like you can see it all over their hands. And I think that this is like a perfect depiction of this passage. Because we are all vying for approval. We're all vying for recognition vying for this applause, when in reality, our hands are just as covered in this glow germ as the next person, right? They're just as covered. But Jesus, he still loves us. He still loves us, even with our dirty, glow germ covered hands. He still pours his grace out on us. And, and let this truth begin the process of transformation into becoming the people that God has called us to be. It brings me to my second point, to be inspired by love. Um, I won't lie, I kind of stole this point from um, our sermon yesterday at, at my church. I go to View Church in Snohomish, and I kind of stole um, what the pastor was saying just because I felt like it was so good and it was so applicable. Um, but be inspired by love. Galatians 5, 6 says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, let love be your greatest aim. You see, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, it's like the, I think it's like the typical like marriage passage, I don't know. But 1 Corinthians 13, it's talking about like without love, what, what is this all for? And so without love, all I say is ineffective. Right? Without love, all that I believe is insufficient. You see, without love, all that I give, it's incomplete. And without love, all that I accomplish, it's inadequate. Right, First Corinthians, I don't remember the exact verse, but it says that love is not self-serving. And so without love, these things are, they ultimately ring true. But Jesus, he wanted the distinguishing characteristic of his followers, to be love, a selfless, Christ-like love that has nothing to do with our ego, that has nothing to do with our status, our position, that has nothing to do with who sees what you do. But like Willard said, it, said it's, the, it's the kind of people that have been so transformed and inspired by the grace and love of Christ that their daily walk, like, through their daily walk, that these good deeds, they just flow out of them naturally without thinking about it, without thinking of it. It just naturally flows from their character because they are so absorbed in the love of God and of those around them. In John 13, 34, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Be inspired by that love of Christ to love one another. Third and final point is be selfless in action. And this, this was kind of a new one for me, this, this spiritual discipline of secrecy. Um, Spurgeon says this, keep the thing so secret that even you yourself are hardly aware that you are doing anything at all praiseworthy. Let God be present 
and you will have enough of an audience. You know, let God be present and let that audience of one be enough. You see, secrecy is this discipline of abstinence or self-denial. It's denying ourselves the attention and the praise. And that's a powerful practice for soul transformation. Right? It's a way to help us get free of people pleasing and managing what these other people think of us. It makes space for a deeper engagement with the Lord and, and, a, and a much more significant dependence on God. And immediately after this, I'm sure the, the next student speaker will get to this, but, in, um, but later on in, in, I think it's verse six of um, this chapter, he says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, Jesus, he often denied this opportunity for applause. Right? Jesus could add all the applause all the time. And I think, like, if it, if it had been us, if I even performed, like, a quarter of the miracles that he did, like, I would be screaming it from the rooftops. <laughs> I'd be telling everybody. Everybody would get to know. Everyone would be able to point to me and see that this, this miracle that I had done. Right? We take every opportunity to make it about ourselves. You see, we would be the, the little Shua showing everybody our two-inch vertical, right? We would be the little kids with the glow germ all over our hands, just comparing to the next person. And don't get me wrong. It's, it's not wrong to let your light shine, as Jesus teaches in Matthew 5. But the key words here are that they may glorify your Father in heaven. And so this is my, my final challenge to you this week. If you want to find freedom from this cycle of, of craving approval, if you want to shift your motivations, do something. Right? It's, not, it's not all about the, just this feeling that we walk away from chapel with. Do something. Do a good work. Volunteer. Bless somebody. Buy that person behind you their Starbucks. Right? But tell nobody. And that's, that's the challenge. Let's try it. Tell nobody. Right? I think it's easy for a lot of us to be like, like, start our sentence, like start our sentences with like, you know, when I was doing my devotions for three hours this morning, like this, right? It's, that's easy for, for these like super Christians to, to start out their sentences like that. But don't tell anybody. Do not post it. Do not proclaim it to everybody you know. They probably didn't ask anyways, right? But consider as you're doing this good work, consider this one thing. Imagine the father's face. Imagine the smile on his face as he looks down on you, as you do that good work. Right? Imagine the father's his, his smile. It doesn't earn his grace or his love. But just imagine the smile. Imagine that smile, that pride, that loving adoration looking down on you. Imagine this, this pride that he sees as his son or daughter carries out a Christ-like act that leads another closer to relationship with him. And let that smile be enough. Let that pride be enough. And let that loving admiration be enough. And, and simultaneously let this, this suffocating weight and burden and bondage of needing approval, let that fall off your shoulders as you get to experience freedom in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much um, for who you are. We just thank you so much that you gifted us this opportunity to, to come into your presence, to learn about you, to study your word. It's such a, it's such a blessing and a privilege we, would, we don't want to take for, for granted. God, let us be transformed by grace, inspired by love, and selfless in action. God, we love you, and we, we ask all these things in your name. Amen.